right, well, hey, church, uh, I've got a confession to make to you. I was, and probably still am, a knucklehead. And uh, I found that out when I was in seventh grade. Uh, I'll never forget, I was in a, a social studies class, and I had this wonderful, gentle, great, little, old teacher and uh, she was my social studies teacher, and I was a knucklehead. And uh, I was, I did this thing called procrastination. You guys know what that is? Where you just kind of put everything off to the last minute. That's, yeah, that's where I do my best work. Um, so I, uh, in the previous class, my math class had given me homework and uh, so I decided that instead of doing social studies in this great little old lady's classroom, I was going to uh, do my math homework. And remember, I had my math book there, and I was just totally zoned out. I was in the zone doing math. I was doing school. And in my mind, I was very much justified. Problem was, I was doing math in social studies. And I remember this sweet old lady, she walked up to me, and she said, Shane, you need to put your math book away. And I looked at her and I laughed a little bit because I was a knucklehead. And I said, I'm doing school in school. You can't tell me what to do. Oh. So it escalated from there. And I remember this cute little old lady, she grabs my math book. And I remember I grabbed the other side of my math book because I'm a knucklehead. And I remember she pulled on that math book, so I pulled back on the math book. And so that was when I got into a tug-of-war match with my social studies teacher. And you can imagine the whole class was just watching this whole, you know, disaster happen in front of them. And she's pulling, and I'm pulling, and she's pulling on the math book. And in that moment, I got the real bright idea that as soon as she pulled, I was going to let go. And I did, because I'm a knucklehead. And that won me one of my many trips to the principal's office. All of that happened because I refused to submit my agenda and what I wanted to do and what I wanted to accomplish to what was going on in her classroom. I refused to submit I refuse to submit. See, that's one of the one of the one another's that we're going to be going through today is that we should, in Ephesians 5:21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That means we lay down our agenda for the agenda of what Christ is doing in the church and not get in a tug-of-war match with other brothers and sisters. Make sense? Hey, church, we've been going through. Uh, the purpose of what we do as a church. We're calling it our scope or our aim for making disciples in Fremont County. And so with that, we went through scripture that we want to be a church that is all about God's word. We want to know God's word. We want to speak God's word. We want to be uh, studiers and learners of God's word. We want to be interpreters in, in the intention of God's word. And so uh, then we want to be a community. And here's where we find ourselves right now is we're talking about what does it mean to be the church? It means to be a community unlike any other community because we're united by Christ. We use the example, I still have my fire pit here, that we come for the warmth and the light of Christ. And what we end up finding is that we're sitting around the warmth and light of Christ with many others who have also come for the light and warmth of Christ. And that is the church. That's how we find ourselves as the church. And we're going to talk about outreach, praise, and evangelism. But today we're in part four of community. How do we become the church? So we've been talking about the one another's. Our first one today is to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. To submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
The word submit itself in our culture is kind of a dirty word, isn't it? Anybody's like, submit is my word of the year. Nobody? Not surprising, right? It's not one of our favorite words. It means to comply, to let go of our agenda, and to submit to uh, the Lord and, and to one another out of reverence for Christ. You now, we've talked about the one another's in that they are impossible for us to practice rightly. Would you agree with that? Our sin nature, our humanity, it is impossible for us to practice the one another's unless what? Unless Christ. And that's where we talked about that our vertical relationship with God, our heavenly relationship with Jesus, is what teaches us how to interrelate with one another on this earth. Amen? So for us to practice submission, we have to look to who? We have to look to Jesus. We have to look to Jesus. How do we submit to one another? There's a passage that comes to my mind when I think about the submission of Christ to the will of God. Can anybody think of that one? It was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before Jesus would put himself would, would be put on that cross. And it was at that point where, as the disciples were failing in supporting Jesus and falling asleep, Jesus is having a dialogue with the Lord, and Jesus says this phrase, let this cup pass from me, right? Let this cup pass from me, and, but then he follows up with something that, treats us, that shows us true submission. He says, but not my will, yours. And he's talking to God the Father. He teaches us true submission. And then we have a prescription in the New Testament in Ephesians. Paul says to the Ephesian church, you need to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So you need to understand that your reverence is not just being serious at church. It's not just uh, fearing the Lord and there's kind of this idea of reverence, but true reverence of Christ means to what? Submit to one another. Submit to one another is how we uh, show reverence for Christ. Have you ever had to submit to something that you disagree with? Anybody? Ever had to submit to something that you disagree with? Um, my wife is so gracious to me. Very rarely do we disagree on things, but I just remember her telling me, uh, every once in a while when, when I come up with a harebrained idea and I, I lead us in that direction, she says, Shane, I'm going to choose to trust you here. I'm going to choose to trust you here. And I think, man, she's incredible for wanting to submit to me like that because we have in Scripture uh, that, that uh, this idea of submission. And typically, uh, I just want to give a shout out to women and to wives. Thank you so much for heeding that call that scripture gives you when you submit to your husbands. And I think uh, men actually need to remember that this verse in Ephesians doesn't just apply to women. It's submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is men included. So women are not just the ones who need to, we all need to work on this idea of submission to one another. We yield to each other out of love, don't we? It's not just one gender to another, but we submit to one another out of love for Christ. By the way, this doesn't mean, what this doesn't mean is that we submit to each other's sin, but it is a, a, merely a point of, uh, so we don't submit to this idea of, of if somebody's walking in sin, we don't submit to their sin, right? We've talked about, and we will talk about that we need to admonish one another as well. You guys know what we'll get there. Amonish means to correct or to challenge. To correct or to challenge, to admonish. So we don't just go along with each other's sin. We have a potential to, uh, if there is one thing we submit to one another, is that we <laughs> submit to one another in our sin, which is not the right type of submission to one another. But there's kind of this idea, if it is an issue of preference within the church interrelating with one another, should we have blue carpet or should we have gray carpet? What color should the walls be? You're going to hear me as a pastor say a lot, I don't care. I don't care. 
whatever. I, I want to submit to, to God's, God's working in people who are much more gifted to me at interior design. That brings up another point is that there is uh, an area for each person to practice their gifting. Amen. The scriptures tell us that all of us have a gifting. All of us have a specialty. There's a uniqueness to every person who's here. So there's a sense that you are professional in the way that God made you to be a professional. And so there is everybody in here has some expertise to bring, don't they? A perspective to share, don't they? And so there's this sense that we should submit to one another when we don't know everything. Amen? That's hard to do. Because uh, in today's world, we all like to think of ourselves as a professional in every arena, don't you? Don't we? I think a lot of us like to express our opinion about how everyone should do everything. You ever notice uh, that, uh, I I always think it's funny you watch Uh, who our society treats as a high authority on things. And as long as you have a doctor in front of your name, it's like you can have an opinion on anything. It doesn't matter if you have a doctorate in plumbing. You can still express opinions about what politics should be, and you have a higher... It doesn't work that way, right? There's this sense that all of us are professionals in some things, and so we need to be listening and submitting to one another, especially when we're outside of our area of expertise. That's why you're not going to hear me make a lot of comments on medical issues. I'm not a medical professional. I know what Scripture says. And so there's some of you have some medical training. I'm going to submit to your expertise in that area. There's a sense that we as a church need to submit to and listen to one another. Can you curb your ear for one another? There are different perspectives. There are different cultures. Aren't there represented here? We need to be people who submit to one another and not just make everybody submit to our culture, to our way of doing life, especially if it's just a point of preference. We need to accept that someone may be gifted in something that you are not or someone may see something that you do not. And that means all of us. That's going to be tricky, isn't it? Church, can we do this? Can we submit to one another? Can we walk into some of those meetings where we think we're right and think, I'm going to hear everybody else out because perhaps, just perhaps, maybe I missed something. We need to submit to one another. Uh, The next one in the one another's is do not lie to each other. And this is, of course, Colossians. Colossians 3.9 says, do not lie to each other. Or so we'll read it here. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And uh, I'm going to input kind of what I think Paul is trying to get at here is that we no longer have to do the white lie thing. Have you ever given a white lie just to try to seem just a little bit more impressive with somebody? You've never done that? Where you, where you kind of talk yourself up maybe a little past what is true? You guys are giving me blank stares like you've never done this. And I just know that's not true. Okay, see, you're, you're giving me a white lie right now. I can see it on your face. Yeah, I think a lot of us like the posture or put on this like um, this best stance um, before one another. And there's this sense that when we enter the church, brothers and sisters, we no longer have to try to be impressive to one another. We don't, we don't have to put on our best face with one another anymore or come off as strong anymore. Why? You guys think about why do we, why are we set free from that? From having to try to impress one another. Because, because who are we most concerned of with their opinion? The Lord. Right. So we're no longer worried about how we impress one another or how we how others look at us. And so we don't, we put on the new self, which is in Christ, right? It's being renewed in this knowledge that that we have been made right with God. Therefore, there is no higher status for anybody in here than rightness with God. 
You are right now, if you believe and trust in Jesus, you are as impressive as you could possibly get because you've been saved by the grace of God. You're impressive because of the grace that you've received. That makes who impressive? Jesus. And so we no longer have to lie to one another to try to impress one another. Colossians 3, 9 through 10. We don't have to do the white lie thing. Uh, I, I think of maybe a good example. I have a little plaque um, that I got from my grandmother. It's called the Fisherman's Prayer. And it's got this little, this is the Fisherman's Prayer. Are you ready? God, give me the grace to catch a fish so big that I don't even need to lie about it. <laughs> but we have a tendency to talk ourselves up a little bit, right? And there's kind of this idea that we have received the grace, that we no longer have to try to impress or lie. Each one is already impressive because of Christ in all. We don't have to seek the approval of others. I think of Colossians 3.11 says, Here there is no, not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, uh, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So what does that mean? Can you be more impressive than Jesus? No. And so don't try to be more impressive than Jesus, but see every person here has who? They're in Christ. And so you are as impressive now. It's kind of encouraging, right? It's like the burden of trying to be impressive is off. I don't have to prove myself to anybody because Jesus has already saved me. That's kind of nice, isn't it? Boy, wouldn't that be nice if that was how it went at work? Anybody seen work competition? Everybody, anybody ever been talking with the boys and every, all the boys are trying to outdo one another? Maybe a few of you heard those conversations. <clears throat> Do not lie to impress one another. So um, we don't want to lie to each other because we are already as impressive as we possibly could be. So let's continue on here. We have to admonish. This is Colossians 3.16. To admonish one another. Let's read what it says here. Uh, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and thankfulness in your hearts to God. And as I looked up the word admonish, I noticed what it means is to correct or to warn one another. To admonish is to correct or to warn one another. And by the way, that's to be centered on what? When we correct one another, do we correct one another based on our preference or our, on our opinion? How do we correct one another? What's the basis of our correction, our warning to one another? The word of Christ. The word of Christ. Right. And so, but there is this sense that we need to be people who correct or who warn one another. I always uh, think about, uh, I think about the, the bus scenario of um, part of evangelism is warning this world that what stands before them in eternity without Jesus is pretty horrendous. It's this thing called hell, where uh, it says the fire will never be quenched. And so there's this, this sense that we need to be people who warn with the word of God. We need to do that gently and with respect, but we need to be warning one another when we see each other walking in a direction that could be harmful. How many of you are just so afraid of conflict that you would prefer not to admonish one another? Where's my conflict avoided people? Right? You're like, if I correct this issue, it's just going to blow. Like, we sometimes do that with our kids. <laughs> My wife and I look at each other like, we know this is wrong, and we know we need to correct it. But if we put our foot down here, it's going to be another two hours of battle. And we're like, oh, man, we're going to have to foot that cost. But there's this sense that we need to love one another enough to correct and to warn one another, don't we? That's, that's a huge part of love. Jesus came and pointed out to us our sin. And showed us 
that we were not right with God and that we needed something. Thank goodness he did that, amen? So we don't correct or admonish or warn one another um, based on preference, bias, or opinion. And by the way, I can't tell you how many times uh, people try to correct one another based on, uh, well, their sense of authority that they're watching. And sometimes that's YouTube videos. I can't tell you how many times I've been told as I'm teaching or, you know, as, as people come up to me, they say, hey, I watched this YouTube uh, video of a guy teaching, and he said that you're wrong. I said, oh, awesome. Show me that in the Word of God. Right? And so there's this sense that we need to correct one another out of the Word of God, but um, a lot of us are admonishing one another out of YouTube. Where we're like, uh, how many of you have had this conversation where like somebody watched a YouTube video and now they're all freaked out about the end of the world? And it was this YouTube video that caused them to be freaked out. Um, or um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Fox News, for example. How many of, of, of you have, have received warning from somebody because of the news outlets that we're all watching? Maybe it's CNN news. I don't care what news. They're all telling you it's doom and gloom, and they're all warning you about something, right? But many of us um, need to spend maybe more time in Scripture admonishing each other from the point of view of Scripture. We must be honest and correct one another in sin, even if it's messy. Even if it's messy. Church, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. A church that does not have any trust within its people can sometimes be a very conflict-free place. So there's this sense that, that um, if we just ignore one another in, in sin and we don't address one another or admonish one another, yeah, it's going to be conflict-free, but is it going to be God-glorifying? See, is there a good kind of conflict that we should have in the church? Yeah, I, I think we should be sharpening one another. There's this sense that we should have varying opinions and that we should be talking about those things and not just sweeping them up under the rug. How many of you have that family topic that you know you can never go there because the family will just blow up? And so all of you just kind of ignore that topic. Anybody? Is that just my family? There's kind of that sense that the church is supposed to be a little different than that. That we're supposed to be able to talk about hard things and have differing opinions. But remember, at the end of the day, we're united by Christ. So I hope you don't agree with everybody here. That tells me that you're more worried about conflict than you are about the word of God. We need to be people who are able to give feedback with one another. Um, I'll tell you, was it was a couple of weeks ago. And by the way, we can't give corrective feedback if we can't even give each other positive feedback. Um, and so there's kind of this, this idea. Uh, we had a room full of men, and I was going through, and I was just giving them honest, positive feedback. Some of you men were there. How uncomfortable was that? And it's like we've got this low trust culture where we can't sit and say, hey, I thank you. I, I did it last week. You guys remember when I pointed out a few of you and said, thank you? Did you see how squirmy those people got? And there's this sense that we, we cannot even give positive feedback or thanks to one another. How could we ever get corrective with one another? But guys, this is the trust level at which the church should operate. That we trust each other to speak positivity into one another for true and honest things and also to correct one another. Do you expect, when you come to church, do you expect the church to help correct you when you're wrong? Maybe easier to say that. That's why if you've ever sat in a membership and you're like, Shane, I want to be a member of the church, um, many of you have heard this. I go, are you sure? Because when you commit to being a member, you're saying, I expect this church to correct me when I'm going off the road. That's a high level of trust, isn't it? That's a community that is willing to go and uh, get messy with one another. Um, I trust you to see the things that I miss. That's why, by the way, I'm not the CEO of this church just because I'm the pastor. We have a plurality of leadership. We have elders, plural. Why it is important that we have elders? 
because I'm a knucklehead. I already explained this to you, right? And that we need a plurality of leaders together all seeking the will of God because we're going to help each other see where we've maybe not listened to the Lord. We need to be a people who correct one another and admonish one another in all wisdom. Christians see the world as it is, the wages of sin is death, and the situation is eternally deadly. And so we have the gospel that tells us that we have a perspective that is extremely important, yes? Extremely urgent. If the Bible is 100% correct and everything that Jesus taught, it tells us that there's a portion of people that are destined for eternal separation from God. And we ought not take that lightly, but that means that we have to have some messy and intense conversations. On behalf, because we love each other enough to say something. That's why we live with the urgency for the gospel. By the way, we don't just speak the gospel to those who are non-Christians. Do we speak the gospel to each other? And is sometimes that needs to be confrontational. Yeah. We need to plead or have the sense admonishing. When I think of admonishing, I think there's this sense that Christians need to kind of have more of a perspective where we're willing to get on our knees and sometimes beg people to understand the the message that we have. Because if it is true, and I believe it is with every fiber of my being, that means that this message, this good news is an urgent news that everybody needs. And in a sense, we need to admonish those in our life, to the gospel. That gives us the tone of pleading, of urging, of begging sometimes to turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. That is admonishing. I think a lot of us would just prefer to have a debate. If we could just argue well enough for people to come into come into to belief in Christ, we would be much more comfortable. But if it means, oh man, I have to humiliate myself and just kind of get to this point where like, hey, I need you to know I'm desperate for you to know Jesus. That's a different tone, isn't it? Hey, look, I know better to better than you versus please, for your own sake, because I love you, look into Jesus. It's a very different tone, isn't it? So we admonish, correct, or we warn. And then we encourage. Um, now, I want to I point out, you guys have had a pretty radical uh, example of two different. I, I would say I'm probably a little bit more gifted in admonishing. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I, that's kind of, uh, that's something that I've just, that's a passion of mine. But you went from, you went from a, a son of encouragement. Tom Hovestall, pastor, the interim pastor. Can I just get an amen that he obviously had the gift of encouragement? Like you could sit in the room And you'd be like, whoa, I feel like a thousand times better. I don't even know what was wrong. And he'd give you, like, he would just charge because he was just the son of encouragement. I think of a guy in the Bible who was like, that was Barnabas. Barnabas was known, actually, his name literally means son of encouragement. And we need people of encouragement. We also need people of admonishing, don't we? So you guys had the extremes. You went from a son of encouragement to an admonishing. I think that's the difference from a Barnabas to a Paul. Maybe I relate to a little bit more like Paul. Uh, but Paul himself was encouraged by Barnabas, wasn't he? Did you guys know who brought Paul and mentored Paul into the church? Barnabas. Barnabas. Paul was encouraged even though he had a lot of history that could have held him back. He really messed up, but Barnabas was a son of encouragement. And so for us, we need to work on encouragement. Look how many times the scriptures tell us to encourage one another. Encourage each other, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. Encourage one another daily. Did you guys see it says daily? Did you get your daily encouraging others? Encourage one another. Build each other up, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. I think I've told you guys before, if the Bible repeats something over and over and over, it means it's kind of important. Do you guys go out of your way to encourage somebody else in the church? 
When's the last time you spoke an encouraging word to somebody? A brother or a sister? Because it even says daily. that this is, this is such a priority that this should be in our daily rhythms with one another. And that it doesn't mean flattery, but it means encouragement. Do you sit down and you try to build each other up or talk each other up? How many of you really struggle taking a compliment, by the way? I'm really finding that that's the culture here, like in Wyoming. It's like compliments are uncomfortable. But how many of you, you're uncomfortable, but you're quietly like, yes. Because that's what I'm like, man. Don't, don't, some of you come up after, you're like, pastor, that was a good sermon. I'm like, oh, that was uncomfortable. But quietly I go home and I'm like, yes. Because we need that encouragement, don't we? We need to build each other up. By the way, Christ lifted us up beyond our station, didn't he? He was an encourager. He was an encourager. We need to, here we go, spur on toward love and good deeds. And let us consider how to stir or spur, uh, spur on or stir up one another to love and good works. By the way, the word stir up or spur, where are my horse riders? When you spur, what do you do? You kind of go like you're kicking them to move on, right? So literally stir up means to poke each other or push each other into good works to equip, to prod each other. It's not like lightly ask if they want to be a part of it, right? It almost makes it seem like um, we need to push each other out of our comfort zones to spur one another on. I think it fits with admonishing, but also that idea that we spur like when riding a horse. By the way, when you spur a horse, is it to hurt the horse? No, it's to direct it, to get it going, right? <clears throat> so there's room, honestly, in our, in our church to spur one another on or have this healthy competition where we push each other to try new things. A couple of things that you could try. How many of you have gone on a prayer walk in the community? I know some of our ladies do. Would that stretch you? There's a good work. Get with a group of people and prayer walk. You could prayer walk circles around some of your neighborhoods or some of our neighborhoods. I prayer walk uh, these apartments. Like We could prayer walk the college and just kind of be a people who spur one another on to praying and praying for others. Or we could spur one another on to helping. I'm just thinking, uh, I was thinking of today, um, Ozzy and Regina, and I'm thinking, hey, I think there's some of us who could lift some hay bales around here. Amen? And our brothers and our sisters, they're not feeling really well. What if a few of us got together and we spurred one another on to uh, some good works of helping out lift some hay bales? Let us spur one another on. Sit, and by the way, don't wait for somebody else to come up with a good work. You ever notice? It's like, man, I would do all this kind of work. I would do all kinds of good work for the name of Jesus. I just need somebody to kind of organize it, to prepare it, and make it really easy for me. Is that us? Yeah. How many of you would, would take that initiative to spur one another on by creating that good work? Some of you, God has called you to where you're at so that you can tell the rest of the church, hey, guys, here's an opportunity for a good work in our community. And we wouldn't know it because you're our representative who God has put out there to show us where we are as a church to be doing good works in the name of Jesus. We're going to talk about that in outreach. We need some coach types who are willing to make us better despite ourselves. Anybody ever have that coach in high school that you're really grateful for or in college that you're really grateful for because they pushed you beyond what you thought you were capable of? We need some coach types who are going to spur one another on. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Let's keep going. Don't grumble against one another. This is James 5, 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. This is James 5, 9. What does that mean? Well, I think it harkens back to honor one another. But how many of you have ever caught yourself 
or each other grumbling about somebody. I always love, uh, here's a, a good advice that a friend of mine gave. He said, open mouth invites hearsay. A closed mouth with a frown shuts it down. So kind of this idea, like if somebody's ever grumbling or complaining about somebody else to you, that never happens, right? What would happen if you were like, instead of, you see the difference? What if we did that with one another? Be like, hey man, don't grumble about them. They're my brother or sister in Christ. What if we caught ourselves in one another's and honestly, there's just some things that don't need to be said, isn't there? How many of you really struggle with that one? By the way, one of the markers of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is self-control, that we would be able to control our mouth from grumbling and complaining. By the way, hurt in the church can lead to grumbling. Anybody there? You ever been hurt? Church hurt? Church hurt? But we can find ourselves grumbling, which always leads to what? Bitterness. You just get bitter. We like to call it venting. Anybody there? I need my person so I can vent. No, you want to grumble and then lead yourself into bitterness, don't you? That's that part of yourself. Venting is a dangerous thing, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It gives your anger and it unleashes it. Uh, so don't let yourself go there as it is a very hard place to get out of. The reason we're told not to grumble against one another is so that there wouldn't be bitterness amongst us. Are you bitter against somebody here? Has somebody said something that you've held on to? We're supposed to avoid that grumbling so that our hearts may not become bitter. And, uh, and these last two are so important. I'm just going to hang on here. Confess your sins before one another and pray. This last week, I was at a youth camp, and we had um, all of these sponsors together, and we just felt like this is spirit of confession. We were talking about this verse and how we need to be a people who is humble enough to deal with our sin with one another, because that is the charge in James, that we pray for one another. Actually, let me read it here. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Some of you, you need to understand, you have been forgiven of sin. God is just and faithful to forgive our sin, amen? He is always faithful. You've been forgiven, but you still have that wide open wound in your life. Anybody there? You know you've been forgiven, but you're carrying scars from ages ago because of your sin. Well, there's this sense that confession is the thing that unlocks what in our life? Confession and prayer unlocks healing in our life. And so some of you, yeah, you've been forgiven, but you haven't said anything to anybody. You haven't worked through it. You haven't had anybody pray for you. And so you're still holding on to this pain, this hurt, this sickness from past sins. Yeah, you've been forgiven and made right with God, but you're carrying a wound that could be healed through prayer if you're willing to be humble enough to confess it to one another. And so with that in mind, we had this uh, sponsor who came up and, and uh, he, he was, man, he was so humble and he just expressed to us, he says, guys, I've been really struggling. I've, I've been uh, hiding alcoholism in my life. I've been a functional alcoholic I, I drink by myself. In fact, my last drink was before I came up on the mountain for this youth camp. And he said, I just, I don't know how to overcome this sin. And so he just, he said, I'm confessing this to you guys right now. And he asked for us to pray. And I'll tell you guys, man, there was not a dry eye in the room. We got up, we put our hands on him and we prayed, Lord Jesus, deliver him and heal him. And I'll tell you, there wasn't anybody in that room that wasn't just in awe of what God can do as far as healing, as far as restoration, as far as delivering things. When we are people who, is willing to, who are willing to confess to each other our sins. Boy, that is scary though, isn't it? Anybody get terrified? You're like, pastor? That sounds terrifying. If we become a people who are humble enough to confess our sins before one another and ask each other for prayer, 
There's this level of trust and intimacy that comes with that, that your heart, like that guy who confessed that, like, I just love him. You know, and like we were in tears, like there's grown men, man. Have you ever seen a room full of grown men just bawling because they're so, they love each other because of Christ and they're so for each other. What if we as a church were like that? We're like, man, we had this kind of brotherhood. That's what the church ought to be. And it comes when we, instead of sweeping or hiding our sin, we begin to confess and deal with it with one another. It literally brings healing. And some of you need that, don't you? And I, I want to uh, close with it, these last two. Offer hospitality. Hospitality without grumbling. You see grumbling again. I think it's funny that those two have to be paired with each other because true hospitality means it's going to cost you something. It's going to be uncomfortable. It literally means the love of strangers, that you're going to have to do something uncomfortable. So don't grumble about it. But practice and show hospitality. I used to do this with college students. Every Sunday night, I would have a group of college students come to my home. There'd be like 25 or 30 of them. And college students... They're stinky, and they don't pick up after themselves. And there were times where I would stay after, and I'd be picking them up, and I'd be like, oh, these college students, like, what did their mom teach them? They, you know, it was like, what's going on? Kind of this idea that I began to, cr- the, to grumble, but uh, the encouragement of Scripture is that we offer hospitality without grumbling. We need to be a people. Um, I was last night, if I could, I'm, I'm going to call some people out, Pat and Larry. You, you want to meet some people that are gifted in hospitality? Meet Pat and Larry. Um, man, just gifted in hospitality. And they challenge me every time when, when Pat lays out those smorgasbords of, of food, I just go, whoa, <laughs> you know, like this is hospitality. I know she loves me. I know that Larry loves me because they've, they've lowered. What if we did that for each other? That we are hospitable toward one another. And the last thing, and I've kind of already alluded to this, but many of these include being humble, to clothe yourself with humility. So likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. To the humble. By the way, humble humility, and we talked about this in our men's group today, humility is not looking down on yourself. To be depressed is not to be humble. Okay? Humility is having an accurate view of yourself. What is an accurate view of self? Well, let me tell you, you're all recipients of God's grace. You are once sinners who have now been saved by God's grace. That's an accurate view of yourself. And so your confidence shouldn't be in you. It should be in who? In Jesus, in our Lord, right? And so there's this sense that we clothe ourselves with the humility of Christ, that we are better than no one. I hope you guys know that um, a lot of times in the past, there used to be hold your pastors in high honor, and it used to be a position of really, you know, um, where it felt like pastors sometimes felt like they were better than others. I hope you know that that's not my heart. I, I look out at a sea of people who are far above and beyond better But all of us together are saved by grace. I don't view myself as better than anybody else, more adept than anybody else, because I also am in need of God's grace just as much as any of you sitting in these chairs. I'm not better than any of you. Every Christian should have that mentality. I'm not better than any of you because you have equal access to the grace of God just as I did. So brothers and sisters, It's been a long journey. It's been a four-parter on community and the one another's. How you doing? Do you guys think we can do this? You think we can do it? The answer is probably not, but by God's grace. So if you look across that list and you're like, man, that sounds like a lot of to-dos, it is a lot of to-dos. And it is impossible for you and I 
unless we press into Jesus who enables us to do things far above and beyond what we thought we could. Church, let's practice the one another's by the power of Jesus and see what he does here. Can we do that? I love you guys. I'm praying for you. I've admonished you. I'm going to send you out in the name of Jesus to live these out with one another. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. God, as they leave here today, I pray, God, that they would go and be the church that we would be a community of people united by you, Jesus, and you alone. That we would be able to practice each of these one on others. God, I pray that you would bring in this congregation and in this family a level of trust that we'd never had before. And I pray that in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen.